Welcome to Abide in the Word. This is our third Sunday edition of Abide in the Word. It's February 20th. Now, normally I hope to do these live, and I did the last one live, but I had something come up at the last minute, and that's the beauty of this platform. I can record it in advance and then schedule it to be posted. Uh, this is something I couldn't avoid, and so uh, we're pre-recorded here. Hopefully nobody was active with a whole bunch of, or hoping to be active with a whole bunch of questions at this evening's Abide in the Word. Last time, nobody was, so I'm not going to stress too much over it. As we do with all of these Sunday evening Abide in the Word sessions, uh, we're going to start out with Psalm 119, reading a portion of it. Uh, we're on the fourth section of it called Dalit, and then we will, uh, after we read it, we will say a prayer based upon it. Hear the word of the Lord. My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Let us pray. Gracious God, we know that we are children of the dust, and so we need you to give us life according to your word. Teach us your statutes that we might understand your way and meditate on your wondrous works. In the midst of the difficulties of this life, we ask that you would give us strength according to your word and that you would put false ways far from us. Today, we choose the way of faithfulness and we set your law before our eyes. By the power of your word and spirit, may we cling to your testimonies that we might not be put to shame. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, before we begin and read our section from the book of Colossians tonight, I just want to encourage you to keep up your repeated reading. Now, I haven't heard from as many people how well this is going this month, but it's been a busy month. I haven't been maybe around as much or seen the same people. Uh, also, you have plenty of time. That's part of the reason we go with the first and third Sundays here. Uh, you still have eight days to dig into the book of Colossians. Uh, plenty of opportunity to do repeated reading and to, for lack of a better term, catch up. You know, there's no quota here, uh, but this is an opportunity for you to dig into it and finish strong. There's so much depth, so mu so many riches to mine from the book of Colossians. I hope you are enjoying it. And if you haven't read it as much as you hoped, I hope you're able to take advantage of the days that are left in this month. And so let's take a look. Like I said, when we started, uh, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23 today. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish as they are used, according to the human precepts and teachings? These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now, I saved this section of Colossians. I didn't do it on the, any of the Tuesday Abide in the Words or look at it at the beginning of the month because I wanted to look at it uh, tonight for this edition of Abide in the Word because this is sort of at the heart of what we're talking about here in the book of Colossians. Remember what we saw previously, the idea that Christ is above all things. He is sufficient. And I talked about how the book of Colossians is addressing this issue in the church in Colossae where they are trying to ascend to a higher, higher spiritual plane. They're looking for stuff outside of Christ, outside of, well, what basically we would call the ordinary means of grace, the preaching of the word, prayer, uh, the sacraments. They're looking for God in other places, hoping to be more like these uh, pagan 
religions or maybe some uh, mystical Jewish stuff uh, to elevate themselves spiritually through these things. And they're feeling as though they are being disqualified. They feel maybe as they're less of believers, less of Christians, less in the eyes of God, maybe even because of this. And so Paul is telling them as the heading that's been added here in our English Bible, telling them, let no one disqualify you. Well, so what it seems was happening here is they were having all these questions about what they should eat, what they should drink, uh, what festivals or, you know, these different Sabbath rituals that they would do. Now, what Paul tells them, and I've highlighted it in yellow here, is that these are a shadow of the things to come. All these things in the Old Covenant law, they were a shadow. They were a type. They were pointing forward to Jesus. They were to tell us something about God, tell us something about ourselves, tell us something about what the Messiah would do. But notice what it says here. The substance belongs to Christ. In other words, those things, they were good things. They were prescribed by God. You were supposed to do them. But they were never meant to be the end-all, be-all. All of that is found in Jesus. He is the one that we go to to grow spiritually, to understand our salvation. And so while these people are being told, don't drink this, don't eat this, oh boy, you're going to struggle spiritually if you don't celebrate this festival or do this special Sabbath observance. Paul is saying, hey, all that stuff, all that stuff we did in the past, just a shadow. It's, there's nothing to it. The substance belongs to Christ. Now, let's think about that. The shadow. Um, the shadow looks like something. Uh, a shadow is always in some way going to be distorted, right? Um, my shadow is not going to give my facial features. Uh, my shadow, depending on where the sun is, is either going to be really short or really long. And there is no substance to it. Um, I can remember as a child, you probably did the same thing. You'd be out for a walk with your parents and you'd be running ahead and you'd try and get, and you would jump and try to uh, jump and touch whether it's your parent or a friend, you would jump on their shadow just for fun, just for something to do while you were walking. You were not hurting them. You could not hurt them. And you knew that as a kid, obviously. You weren't trying to harm your parents jumping or your friend by jumping on a shadow. But this, this shadow, there's no substance to it. It, it passes, right? Uh, sun goes behind a cloud, your shadow can disappear. You, you step into another shadow, it disappears, but you're still there. Um, it it has the shape. It shows us what something sort of looks like, but it does not give us the ultimate details. So that's the idea here. Uh, you would not see my shadow and then ever be able to pick me out of a lineup, right? Uh, so what are these people doing? They're looking to the shadow, and the shadow was a good thing. It, it, it was the shape of Christ. It pointed us to Christ. It gave us the idea of who he would be, but it was not Christ himself. And so as we think about what all this has to do with us, we can see some emotions that perhaps come through in what Paul is saying here. Notice verse 18, let no one disqualify you. Uh, these people were probably feeling like they had been disqualified from the faith or that they were lesser Christians. Have you ever felt like that? As I said, when we think about what this means for us, have you ever felt like that? Have you ever looked at someone and because you didn't do a particular thing that they did, uh, you didn't feel like you were quite the same. Maybe you looked at some uh, religious tradition and, and questioned the value of your religious tradition because you didn't do this thing or that thing or do something in, in a particular way. Well, Paul says to the people in Colossae and to us, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. Now, asceticism is this idea of, of this appearance of holiness or or even asceticism could be um, like monasticism to some degree, doing these things that, that supposedly have some value to you spiritually. But Paul is saying, don't insist on these things. They're going into detail about visions, um, puffed up without reason by the, a sensuous mind. All of that stuff, all of this stuff means nothing if you have Christ. Um, all these visions that people claim to have, that they don't mean anything if, if they're not 
look if they're looking for something beyond Christ, because Christ is the end all be all. He is the one. And notice, notice he says we're to hold fast to the head because that's how the whole body is nourished and knit together. We're all tied together. We need to be connected to Christ. And notice what that growth is. It's growth. That's from God. It's actual actual growth. So the idea that we that we would come out of this with is that if we want to grow spiritually, we need to be connected to Christ. Because any growth that happens apart from him, is that really growth? Well, no, it would not be. That's why we insist on the glorification of Jesus. That's why we insist on the word that tells us about Jesus. This is why we we trust that the Spirit is helping us in our spiritual growth because all of that is connected to Jesus. That is how we grow. And so here to the church in Colossae, we have this, this last section that Paul has here that we've read, verses 20 through 23. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why is if you were still alive in the world do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, taste, touch. So what Paul is saying is, If Jesus has set you free, if you have all that you could ever hope for in Christ, why are you worried about these other things of the world? Set your mind on things above. Set your mind on Christ. Learn about him. Pray to him through, uh, pray to, to the Father through him. Hold on to these things, not according to these human ideas of how you grow spiritually. Hold on to what the Bible says. Hold on to, uh, again, the word and sacraments. This, These are the places where God has promised to be. Prayer, these ordinary, regular means of grace, nothing flashy. There's no asceticism in them. Uh, there's nothing that would puff us up. These are ordinary, everyday things that you and I can do, whether that is on our own or with the church through the sacraments. These are the things that build us up in faith. And so, while that seems sort of contrary, well, if I want to get higher, I need to have these special things. Isn't it wonderful that the ordinary means of grace, prayer, uh, the word, sacraments, isn't it wonderful that they're ordinary? I just find so much comfort and peace in that, that I don't have to go looking for something special, some magic trick, some magic tip that's going to help me to elevate to the next spiritual level. Instead, I have everything that I need in Christ, and he comes to me through his word, through the sacraments. I can pray to him, uh, pray to the Father through him. He's interceding for me. I have all these things through ordinary things. How beautiful is that? No matter where I am, that can happen. And, And notice, we can sort of see something pointing here as we think about this to Reformed worship, right? What do we need to worship. A Bible, water, bread, wine or grape juice, uh, a pitch pipe. If we want to sing the Psalms, we could just sing the Psalms to a tune. Um, We don't have to sing. We could read the Psalms. Um, No matter where we are, the ordinary means of grace are portable. Uh, No matter what happens, we can do them. You may remember we did a baptism in, I think it was 2016. Did a baptism without electricity. We did just fine. We sang with the piano. We had the word. We had the water. It went down. We did it. Great memory. I love to talk with the child whose baptism we did that day about that. Now that she's five years old, it's great to tell her that we did that and that uh, we were faithful to baptize her, regardless of the things that went on around us, because it's ordinary. It's wonderful. It's, It's amazing. I don't mean ordinary isn't boring. I mean, as it's possible to do it anywhere, anytime, any place. All you need is is water and the word, right? And so why are we always looking for that tip, that trick, that better thing, that that means by which we can escalate, uh, that we can move ourselves up? We, We think we're just one little experience away, don't we? But those are not the things that that we have been given to grow in faith. Notice verse 23, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. Now, they maybe had some things where maybe they harmed themselves, they starved themselves, something like that. But they're of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. 
Those are not the things, the things that we dream up on how to grow spiritually. Those, those are not the things that are going to help us with our struggles with sin. What is going to help us is the word and the spirit, the things that God has ordained. And so as we read the book of Colossians here, I hope that you are encouraged that Jesus is more than enough and that he comes to us in, in, in the best of ways, ways that you and I can, can understand and it's accessible to everyone. I, I was appreciating the way we do communion. Uh, you would think in, in, from our worldly mindset, right? That if we wanted to have more of Jesus, if we wanted to have uh, something we could do to elevate, to get higher, well, then maybe I could have more bread or I could have more wine or juice, right? But instead, what do we do? We hand out a small piece of bread. We hand out a small amount of juice. Everybody gets the same amount. Why? Because it's sufficient. It's enough. We know that it is just a foretaste of the feast to come. We know that one day we will feast in the house of Zion and we will all feast. We know that God comes to each one of us through his word and through his spirit. And it, there, there is no one who is, who is a favorite. And it's shown in the fact that God comes to us this way. What, a, what an amazing blessing this is to God's people. And so I hope as we read Colossians, we will take joy in the fact that Jesus is enough. That no matter what happens, we have him. As long as we have the word and as long as the spirit indwells us, which the spirit continues to indwell us, we believe that God holds us in his hand. He brought us to faith. He isn't going to let us go. As long as we have those things, we can grow in faith. He comes to us just as he came to us in salvation. He comes to us in sanctification. He helps us to grow through those means. Now, it looks different for everybody, but we all have the same opportunity. We don't have to starve we don't have to uh, follow special days. No, God comes to us through the means that which that he has ordained. And that is a beautiful and wonderful thing. All right, let's move on to the final sections, sections of this evening Abide in the Word session as we take again, or once again, take a look at the Belgic Confession. So last time, uh, we looked at Article 2, and I'm going to scroll up to it to remind us of what it was. Article 2, the means by which we know God. And I'll summarize real quick what we saw there. We saw that God comes to us, that we are able to understand, know God, and he comes to us through two means, through two avenues, I guess you could say. That is special revelation and general revelation. General revelation is our ability to see that there is a God, to know that God exists through looking at creation, right? We look at a tree, we see the design, we look at, at the stars and see the way uh, things are. And th those feelings that you have when, when you look at creation, you go, how can anybody deny that there is a designer of this, right? That, that's general revelation. But as I always say when I look at Article 2, uh, while though that stuff can let us know there's a God, and as Romans 1 says, it, it makes sure that we are without excuse, that we know that there is, in fact, a God. We cannot know the gospel from the beauty of a tree or a sun, the beauty of a sunset or the beautiful intricacies of the human cells or from looking at the stars. We would not know that God took on human flesh, bore the wrath of God that we deserve for our sin, rose again and has now ascended to the right hand of the Father, we would not know that from a tree. And so there is special revelation, which is in the word of God that tells us this story of salvation. And as I've been mentioning a lot this evening, that is one of the means by which God comes to us. We hear the word, we hear the gospel, the Holy Spirit works in us, and we come to faith. That is special revelation that we need this word of God to know that God has spoken, that he has rescued a people for himself. So now we get to Article 3 about the written Word of God. And it says that we confess that this Word of God was not sent nor delivered by human will, but that men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God, as Peter says. Afterward, our God, with special care for us and our salvation, commanded his servants, the prophets and apostles, 
to commit this revealed word to writing, God with his own finger wrote the two tables of the law. Therefore, we call such writings holy and divine scripture. And so what we see here is that we believe that when we look at the written word of God, which is uh, what we would call the Bible, holy scripture, we believe that this is God speaking. This is not the thoughts of humans. Now, humans wrote it down, as the Belgic Confession says. But God moved through the Holy Spirit for these people to write. And this is important, that we see that he um, committed this revealed word to writing. It's written down. If it changes, we can take exception to it, right? This idea of the written word of God, as opposed to some sort of inclination or feeling that people might have in the moment, we can go to the Bible. I don't have one sitting here. It's out of reach. Um, But we can go to the Bible and say, no, the Bible says this. What you are saying, God is saying, does not comply with his word. What what an amazing gift that is. Uh, Imagine if we were at the whim of anyone who said, God spoke to me. You can see the danger in that. And throughout church history, there have been people who claim to do that. And we have seen the dangers of, of that. And so how wonderful is it that this revealed word is committed to writing? We know what God said. We can evaluate it. We can uh, compare what, uh, what people are saying about it. Uh, we are able to tell what is the truth from it. And we know that God's word is not going to change. Uh, The means by which he saves people is not going to become something different. We can trust in the gospel. And because it's written down, it's the revealed word of God, we have trust that our salvation comes from God, period. End of the day, that's what matters. We know. We know because it was revealed to us in this way. Now, next month on our first Sunday, we'll be taking a look at what those canonical books are, what the official books of Scripture are. But we know that we call those books that we're going to be reading the names of uh, in the first Sunday in in March, we know that we call those holy and divine Scripture. We can trust that this is the Word of God. And so let's dig into that Word. Let's get to know the book of Colossians and continue to get to know other books of the New Testament in Abide through abide in the word, digging into it because we know that this is the word of God. This is actually God speaking to us. That's why we want to dig into it. That's why we want to get to know it because we actually believe that this is God speaking to his people. All right, let's let's finish up here uh, as I close us out with prayer. Holy God, we are so blessed that you are a God who has revealed yourself to us. We thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you that we can go to it and know that you have spoken. And the best part of all of it is that you have spoken that we are saved. That even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you came to us by your grace and you have made us righteous in Jesus Christ. So may we celebrate that joy. May we desire to know more about your word that we might more perfectly serve you and love you in your world in this coming week. We pray, O Lord, that you would bless your people, that Christ might be glorified in all things. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. And now a quick blessing for the week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Depart in that peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week. If you have any questions about Colossians, let me know. Fire me an email, a text, any means, a WhatsApp, whatever. Whatever means you want to contact with me with, you can. More than happy to answer any questions. And again, I apologize that this was not live. If you did have questions, as I said, I had something come up. I needed to do a visit. And so we ended up pre-recorded, which is easier for me, but it would have been a lot more fun to interact. Hopefully we can do that next month. Have a great week.